In this lecture, I want to discuss how LLMs like ChatGPT and GPT-4 have conquered NLP, in the sense that this one technology resulted in huge performance gains in a wide variety of NLP tasks. This lecture is not related in any practical sense to the other lectures in this section, but I wanted to include it because it provides important context for what LLMs can accomplish. And I hope it inspires you to think about what you can use LLMs for. It would also help if you have some familiarity with common NLP tasks, like question answering, text summarization, information extraction, and so forth. Those of you who took my Transformers course or the prerequisite NLP course will have first-hand experience with some of these tasks. So you know what goes into solving these problems the classic way. So let's start with question answering. To begin, we'll look at how this task was solved in my Transformers course. No worries if you haven't taken this course. It's just a callback that will be useful for those that have taken the course. And again, that first-hand experience really helps you to appreciate how far we've come. So question answering in my Transformers course was done using an encoder-only model like BERT instead of a decoder-only model like GPT. As always, tasks are typically converted into some form of classification or regression. In this case, we choose classification. In this class, we did extractive question answering, as opposed to abstractive question answering. Extractive question answering merely selects a subset of the input text to be the answer to the question. As you can imagine, this is much easier than abstractive question answering, which generates the answer from scratch because we only need to select a subset of the input text to answer the question. This basically amounts to classifying which of the input tokens should be the start of the answer, and which of the input tokens should be the end of the answer. There's a lot of tricky coding that goes into this, and if you've coded this up yourself, as we did in my Transformers course, you know how much of a challenge it can be. Basically, we put a softmax on every time step of the input to choose the best start and end tokens for the answer. There are complications, however. For example, what if the predicted start token comes after the predicted end token? That doesn't make sense. In any case, it is difficult. On the other hand, abstractive question answering was merely wishful thinking until chat GPT. Models simply could not generate text coherent enough to produce meaningful answers to questions. Chat GPT, however, essentially always does abstractive question answering. More precisely, it is trained to follow instructions, so it'll do whatever you tell it to do, including answering questions. And all of its answers are generated on the fly, and they are completely coherent, albeit sometimes factual information is hallucinated. Furthermore, it does this with no required context at all, in which to look up the answer, although that can be provided in order to improve answer accuracy. You'll learn more about how we can incorporate useful context as input to an LLM when we discuss RAG. Another common NLP task is text summarization. Again, this comes in extractive and abstractive forms. We looked at extractive text summarization in my first NLP course. Again, no worries if you haven't taken that course, but having worked through the algorithm yourself will help you appreciate the complexity of the task. So for extractive text summarization, the goal is to choose the best small subset of sentences in a document that will convey the maximum amount of useful information about that document. This is extractive because we're not generating any new text. We're just selecting a subset from the given text. And as before, doing anything else would have been very difficult or impossible with pre-LLM technology. But now, LLMs are capable of understanding their input text well enough to generate a summary on the fly using phrases that didn't even necessarily appear in the input text. Even crazier, you can ask an LLM to explain like I'm five, which will use simple analogies to everyday experiences that will help you understand a concept. Another important NLP task is information extraction, a subset of which is relation extraction. This is also a very interesting task that I haven't covered in my previous courses using classical methods. But now that we have LLMs, those classical methods are largely unnecessary. In my opinion, due to the wide variety of possible ways there are to say the same thing, LLMs are probably the superior choice for this task anyway. Relation extraction is all about finding specific relationships in text, like who is the leader of a company. 
There are many ways to say, Bill Gates is the CEO of Microsoft, or Steve Jobs is the head of Apple. Side note, I know this is no longer the case, they are just examples. The important thing to note is that there are so many ways to state this information, it would be silly to try and hard code all the different patterns that one might see in text without missing anything important. Instead, a better approach may be to simply let an LLM do the work. Furthermore, LLMs can output structured data like JSONs, which at a high level is what information extraction is all about. It takes unstructured information, like a text document, and outputs structured information that can be stored in a JSON or database table. One example of a classic NLP task that LLMs can do, but that you don't necessarily want to use them for, is text classification. So for example, you can ask ChatGPT, please classify this text as either spam or not spam. While it's possible to ask an LLM to give you an answer to this question, it is not necessarily performant either in terms of efficiency or accuracy. Recall that the best performing LLMs have many billions of parameters, so much so that you can't even fit them onto your local computer. As such, this won't scale up to processing the number of emails that services like Gmail have to process. One statistic I've seen is that Gmail processes over 10 million spam and malicious emails per minute. As you can imagine, trying to use an LLM like ChatGPT to make this many predictions in that little time is infeasible. Furthermore, it is unclear whether or not ChatGPT would even beat the performance of a simpler classifier, like Naive Bayes or the Support Vector Machine. This doesn't take away from the massive revolution that ChatGPT represents. It simply means that there are right tools for the job, and there are wrong tools for the job. One mistake I often see amongst beginners is they try to use the most powerful tool currently available for any given task which, as can clearly be seen in this example, can be at best suboptimal or at worst infeasible. In the previous lecture, we looked at how LLMs have revolutionized NLP and help us to easily perform classically difficult NLP tasks with ease. In this lecture, we'll look at how LLMs change the machine learning workflow from a practitioner's perspective. You've already seen that LLMs can perform many NLP tasks out of the box, like text classification. What does this mean for machine learning practitioners? The classic process for producing a machine learning model and pushing it to production goes something like this. First, we need to collect data. In some cases, this can be expensive, and it might require a lot of manual labor. For example, you might need to clean the data and remove spam, and you might need to label the data for supervised tasks. Second, you'll need to split the data yourself into train, validation, and test sets. Third, developing a machine learning model is an iterative process. You'll try one thing, see how well it performs, and then try to improve upon it by trying other techniques you've learned about machine learning. Finally, you'll evaluate your model in production and continually iterate as you monitor how it performs. This entire process can take many months or even a year to do. It's not easy and might even require more than one person, since the mechanisms for data collection and storage might be implemented by a data engineer, while model development might be implemented by a machine learning engineer or data scientist. Furthermore, this doesn't include any outsourcing required for data labeling. But now that we have LLMs, a lot of that hard work goes away. Since LLMs can give you an answer right away, there's no need for data collection or model training. You don't need to do any feature engineering or tune hyperparameters in your model. Instead, you can just ask your LLM. Now, there are some important caveats here. Firstly, only you know your business, so it's up to you to make an appropriate list of trade-offs. One great example was given in the last lecture, when we discussed spam detection for Gmail. As mentioned, Gmail has to filter over 10 million spam and malicious emails every minute which is a much higher throughput than an LLM like ChatGPT can handle. 
Aside from feasibility, even if it were feasible, you still have to consider things like cost. I'm surprised to hear how many people think ChatGPT can be used for anything. But when I ask them how much it will cost, they have no clue because they haven't done that calculation. There might be a case where the cost of data collection, labeling, and model development ultimately cost more than using an LLM. But note that this is an upfront cost, whereas using an LLM is an ongoing cost. But again, you have to do these calculations yourself, since only you know your business. Another factor I mentioned is performance. If Naive Bayes performs better than an LLM, why would you use an LLM? Therefore, it's imperative that you actually evaluate different models and make an appropriate trade-off between accuracy and cost. In this lecture, we will discuss OpenAI's usage policies, which are designed to ensure the safe and responsible use of these tools, while providing maximum control over your creations. By utilizing OpenAI services, users agree to adhere to these policies, aimed at fostering innovation while preventing harm. Let's dive into the specifics. Firstly, we have the universal policies, which apply across all OpenAI services, including ChatGPT, labs.openai.com, and the OpenAI API. These rules are essential to maintaining a safe and ethical environment. Compliance with applicable laws. Users must refrain from activities that violate laws, such as compromising privacy, engaging in illegal activities, or exploiting children. Protection from harm. Users should avoid using our services for promoting self-harm, developing weapons, or engaging in unauthorized activities that harm individuals or property. Respect for safeguards. Users are prohibited from attempting to circumvent safety measures unless authorized by OpenAI or related to research conducted within their guidelines. Moving on, for those building with the OpenAI API, there are additional considerations. Privacy. Respect the privacy of others by refraining from collecting or processing personal data without complying with legal requirements. Safety and well-being. Avoid activities that significantly impair the safety, well-being, or rights of others, such as providing unreviewed legal or medical advice or facilitating gambling. Avoiding misuse. Users must not misuse our platform to deceive or mislead others, including generating disinformation or impersonating individuals or organizations. Finally, it's worth noting that OpenAI employs a combination of automated systems, human review, and user reports to enforce these policies. Violations may result in warnings, content restrictions, or account actions. So in this short lecture, I want to tell you about my suggestion box. The idea behind this is analogous to the kind of suggestion box you would find at a restaurant. You can write down your thoughts and leave them for the owner to look at to give them feedback so that they can improve your dining experience. In order to share your thoughts with me in my suggestion box, please go to lazyprogrammer.me slash suggestions. Here you will find a simple form where you can tell me anything you like. I have a few suggested fields, but none of them are required. However, they would be helpful for me to know. For example, tell me your background. I think someone coming from a background in marketing is going to have very different feedback compared to someone coming from a PhD in physics. Tell me what course you are taking so I have some idea of what you are talking about. Obviously, the more specific you are, the better I can help you. Tell me how difficult you thought the course was. Was it too easy? Was it too hard? Tell me if there was something I neglected to explain. For example, was there some word that I used that you have never heard of? Was there Python code that you haven't seen before? Tell me what you thought was missing from the course, even if it was just something small, like you missed explaining this line of code. Were you looking for an algorithm that wasn't included? 
This is helpful for me, but it's also helpful for you because many times students are looking for an algorithm or an explanation in the wrong course. So I can say, actually, I teach that algorithm or I explain that thing in such and such course, and this isn't the right course, so have a look over there. Are there any topics you want to request that were not included in this course? For example, maybe you signed up for a deep learning course and you were looking for a CNNs, but the course didn't have CNNs in it. Let me know. Finally, let me know your suggestions for future courses. If there's a particular topic you want me to teach that I don't yet have a course about, such as gradient boosting or transformers or even quantum mechanics, let me know. Finally, there is a big text box for any comment you want to write. You can write anything in this box and make it as long as you want. In fact, the longer the better. If you think I talk too slow or I talk too fast, let me know. If you think my prerequisite instructions aren't fair, let me know. I want you to be as specific and as detailed as possible. A lot of the time people give me comments that I can't really act on, which is unfortunate. And this is often because they are too generic and not specific enough. Tell me exactly what lecture and exactly what timestamp you're referring to. If you want to refer to a question on the Q&A, include a link. Be very specific and give me concrete examples so that I know exactly how to act on the information you've given me. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next lecture.